There we go. So. Thank you for backing it up. Do what? Thank you for backing up. Sure. So before we get started with the seventh and eighth commandment, are there any other lingering questions about the, the fifth, sixth, or even the first three, four? No. Do on. we not have John and Kathy? Yeah, they're there. They're Maybe. there. All right. So, other questions? Once, twice, sold for free. One indulgence. All right. So, the seventh commandment is where we start tonight. Um, and it's pretty simple. You shall not steal, right? Okay. Um, so look with me, if you will, to Joshua chapter 7. Now, I personally find that Joshua is one of the best books in the Bible. Um, it's got a great title, good lead character. Um, but, you know, I may be biased in that, so... Were you named for it? I was indeed. Seven what? Uh, just Joshua seven one. When Sherry was our pastor, her son was named Joshua, and he was named for it also. Seven yeah. one. Yeah. So I have a sister named. Well, my dad's name was Mark. So obviously. Mark, um, and I have a sister named Sarah, and then for some reason, even though Sarah is one of the twins, they changed direction and stopped with biblical names and gave the other twin the name Melissa, and my last sister, Amanda, so I, I don't know, maybe they looked at me and thought the biblical thing wasn't working out, I'm not sure. <laughs> so... Okay, so Joshua 7, 1. The Israelites did a disrespectful thing concerning the items reserved for God. Achan was the, Achan was the son of Carmi, grandson of Zabdi, great-grandson of Zerah. He was from the tribe of Judah. He took some of the things reserved for God. So the Lord was furious with the Israelites. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth-Avon, to the east of Bethel. He said to them, Go up, scout out the land. So the men, up, the men went up and scouted out I. They came back to Joshua and said to him, There is no need for all of the people to go up. Two or three thousand men can go up and strike I. Don't make all the, men, all the people bother going there. There are just a few of them. So about three thousand men from the people went up in that direction, but they fled from the men of I. The men of I struck down approximately 36 of them. They chased them from outside the gate as far as Shebarim. They struck, down, struck them down on the slope. Then the hearts of the people melted and turned to water. Joshua ripped open his clothes. He, along with the elders of Israel, lay flat on their faces before the Lord's chest until evening. They put dust on their heads. Then Joshua said, Oh no, Lord God, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan? Was it to hand us over to the power of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been prepared to live on the other side of the Jordan. Please forgive me, Lord. What can I say now that Israel has retreated before its enemies? The Canaanites and the whole population of the land will hear of it. They will surround us and make our name disappear from the earth. What will you do about your great name then? Joshua tends towards the chicken little theory. One bad thing is a terrible thing. The Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why do you lie flat on your face like this? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the things reserved for me and put them with their own things. They have stolen and kept it a secret. The Israelites can't stand up to their enemies. They retreat before their enemies because they themselves have become a doomed thing reserved for me. I will no longer be with you unless you, have, unless you destroy the things reserved for me that are present among you. Go and make the people holy. Say, get ready for tomorrow by making yourselves holy. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Israel, things reserved for me are present among you. 
You won't be able to stand up to your enemies until you remove from your presence the things reserved for me. In the morning, come forward tribe by tribe. Whichever tribe the Lord selects must come forward clan by clan. Whichever clan the Lord selects must come forward family by family. Whichever family the Lord selects will come forward by individual soldiers. The person selected who has the things reserved for God must be put to death by burning. Burn everything that belongs to him too. This is because he has violated the Lord's covenant and committed an outrage in Israel. So fast forward through the next bunch of verses where they do exactly what God says. And uh, Achan gets um, God. So along with all this stuff. All because he stole and particularly stole from the Lord. All right. So the reason that I go to that particular story um, is one, it illustrates how serious God takes the commandments first, but it also illustrates a, a second point. When we talk about stealing, we're not talking about just stealing from our neighbor. When you steal anything, you are taking from God because none of the stuff that you have is yours. God has given you everything you have. So God is the only one who has ownership over anything. You know, even this microphone here, it's not mine. It doesn't matter if it's got my name on it. God gave me the resources to get this microphone, broke though it is. And so it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to God. I'm just using it. And I'm supposed to use it for the benefit of my neighbor. So anytime you steal something, you're stealing from God. And God doesn't like that very much. Okay. When Luther talks about this commandment, um, what does his explanation say? Uh, we are to fear and love God so that we do not take our neighbor's money or property or gift them in any dishonest way, but help him to improve and protect his property and means of living, of making a living. So Luther looks at it a couple different ways. One, there's the idea of, you know, outright stealing from someone. Okay, you are not to go and take something that doesn't belong or has not been given to you to use. So if I walk across the street where they're working on that house and take a, a Sawzall because I want it, then I've committed a sin because I've stolen it, right? That's the easy, you know, very legalese explanation. But what if, um, what if I go buy something for someone and when I go give it to them and they pay me back, I tell them that it costs more than it actually did so that I can make some money on it too. Have I been stolen from them? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, have we agreed? Telling a lie, which is another. Yeah. It, it all it's all intermingled. Um, now, have we agreed beforehand that I would get it for them and give it to them at this price? That's different. We talked about it. They know what that I'm getting a little bit of money out of it for having and gone and gotten it for. Them. But if I never tell them and I just make out like the price was this and they pay me that when I didn't pay that much, then I've stolen the difference there and broken their trust and violated some other commandments too. Um, anytime you steal something, you've stolen obviously, but anytime you try to defraud someone or you try to get one over on somebody or anytime you try to um, make a little extra profit or anything like that, you're guilty of the sin of stealing. You're guilty of having hurt your neighbor and not wishing them the best and helping them make the most of what God has given them. And you're also taking from God because God didn't give you that stuff to use. God gave it to your neighbor. You know, now if your neighbor was nice, your neighbor would let you use it too if it's like a drill or something. But if you break it like Stephen did, I don't know if you see that in the chat, 
some $25,000 drill, then, you know, that's, that's not good either. Stephen, was well, it really 25000 Stephen claims that his family is hard-headed. I don't, I don't know why he thinks his family is. <laughs> well, see, now that's, that's getting to the next commandment, Barbara. We'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So when I, when I looked at the large catechism for this, the, this commandment raises another problem with Luther. Luther gets angry about things sometimes and goes on little tirades. Um, this was the problem with some of his writings and why I, I often say that what he needed more than anything else was an editor because an editor would have been able to cut these sections out and say, no, you can't say that. Um, but Luther didn't have that. And so he goes on this little tirade about servants stealing from their masters and, and how they're, they're robbing them blind and everything. Um, so obviously he would not be a fan of Robin Hood. He did not support the idea of stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. Um, but that's because Luther would have been more in the upper class. And he needed to be able to justify what he was doing in his movement, which was essentially stealing property from the Catholic Church and reappropriating it as Lutheran. Um, so he again, much like we saw him do with murder, he twists himself up into a pretzel to be able to justify what he is doing while also condemning basically the same thing that other people are doing. Um, this is why I didn't make you read the large catechism, because you come off with a much better view of Luther from the small catechism. The large catechism makes you go, why do we call ourselves Lutheran? Um, yeah. So what questions do you have about this particular commandment? Is there anything that doesn't make sense about it or the explanation that's in that little book that you have? I have a comment, uh, not, a, not a question, but um, as far as, as Luther uh, justifying himself and doing the same thing that other people are doing, I think that we can also learn from that because yeah. a lot of times we're prone to do that. Yeah, and I mean, you know, we as the Lutheran Church, I, I can't speak to, to other Lutheran denominations, but the ELCA has tried to be um, trying to think of the word um, intentional about pushing back against some of the things that Luther did that, and some of the things he said that, that are not acceptable now. Um, you know, we often get accused of hating Jews um, because we speak for the Palestinians very often, but the Lutheran church has always been a big supporter of the Jewish faith and, you know, of the state of Israel. We just, the ELCA has been a supporter of finding a way to, you know, not for Muslims and Jews not to hate each other anymore and to get along and live there together. Um, the same thing with Muslims, because Luther was quite adamant that they were essentially useful only if they destroyed the papacy. Um, he didn't think they should exist. So his goal was for them to, to destroy Rome and then become Lutheran, apparently, which didn't happen. Um, so we've tried to push back against some of that while also keeping some of the good. Um, you know, there again, if you want to tear down a statue, it's at the seminary. It was also supposed to have Katie Luther there, but they never got enough money to put her up. So it's just him and his little tankard of beer. So. All right. So let's see. Um, one of the important things that this little book right here lifts up is about how we're supposed to take these possessions that belong to God and use them for the benefit of others. So it's not a matter of, of hoarding things. So 
you know, if I, if I've got something that I can use to help somebody else and I decide not to do that, then that in and of itself is a form of stealing because you're depriving somebody of something that you could have done for them. And you're also keeping something that God gave you for the use of, to help others to yourself. Um, mainly because you didn't want to use it for somebody else. You wanted to keep it to yourself. So, you know, I, I get where that's difficult. You know, when I, I grew up with three sisters, I had to lock my door when I left because if I didn't, everything that I possessed would be in their room when I got back. I mean, everything, like they'd even take the blankets sometimes. It was weird. Um, when I got home from the Navy, I discovered that one of them had been living in my room. Even though it had been padlocked by my dad when I left, they had opened the window and been living in my room. I, you know, it's, they said it was because they missed me, but it's really because they missed being able to have easy access to my stuff. Um, and I'd never reacted well to that because, you know, it was mine, right? Well, that's not a real Christian way to be because uh, it's not ours. It's, you know, I, we don't possess anything. We just are using it. So that's also really difficult because if you have any money in the bank at all. Yep. The solution to that is what I've done and that's just be poor. So <laughs> I, I, I figured, I figured that out a long time ago. Oh, uh, let's see. So yeah, so we're, we are to regard our possessions as means to an end, the good of our neighbors. The secret is knowing the difference between ownership and use. So all things belong to God. They are given to us both to enjoy for ourselves and to use for the good of others. So we live in a society that makes big, big deals about uh, property rights. It's enshrined in every part of the Constitution. You know, we're a, a society that is really focused on that. So what does it look like for us as Christians to be in a society that says that we should be very, very um, focused on our stuff? And that is a question for all of you to think about and offer viewpoints on. Well, it sounds socialist. I'm not sure what the question means. So the question is, we live in a society that that is overly focused on property and possessions and saying that it belongs to us and you can't have it, you can't use it? It's ours. Yes. So what does it look like for us to be Christians in a society like that when God calls us to be very different than what society is saying we should do? We as Christians are not supposed to get overly focused on possessions or what's ours or not ours because none of it's ours, it's God's. Does that make more sense? Yeah, and quite honestly, the way it makes you look sometimes is like you're a pushover or gullible. Yeah. Yeah, it makes it easier for people to take advantage of you. Yes, been there, done that, got the patch. Yeah, mm -hmm. but the reality is that's, that's, you know, not that there's a giant book that God's making marks in or anything, but, you know, that's a good mark on you, you know, yeah, that person did something they weren't supposed to, they took advantage of you, but at least you were willing to give, at least you were trying to do the right thing. You know, that doesn't what mean I, go out and get taken advantage of all the time, but. What it's hard say, well, for me to work hard to get what I have and then give it away to somebody that sits on their duff and twiddles their thumb. But see, therein lies the problem. Because the way you just said it, where you work hard and you get the stuff as a reward for working hard, 
that feeds into the mindset of society that if you do this, you'll get this. Whereas the mindset that God is calling Christians to is that if you live life the way you're supposed to, God will give you what you need to get through life. Do you get what I'm saying? So it's not a matter of what you worked for or didn't work for. It's a matter of God giving you, lending you things, basically, that is meant for the benefit of yourself and others. God will provide. Right. Okay, I understand that. But at the same time, I have years ago put myself to the point where I put my own finances in detriment by helping other people out. Yeah. So I think there's a balance. There has to be a balance. Um, there should be, I don't think God's calling you to give everything you have away and, and just be poor and broke and, and live off other people. Um, people tried that. At, shortly after Christianity began, and it, it didn't work out all that well. Um, there, there's a limit, but the idea is that you're willing to push towards that limit rather than setting it somewhere else and saying, you know, this is my cutoff because that doesn't leave me enough. Does that make sense? Or am I just babbling? No, I mean, I've always trusted that when we help somebody, you know, it's like, well, God's always provided for us, and he always has. Don't get me wrong. But no, I've never really set a limit because you do, you do what's necessary. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to figure it out. I, I feel when we talk about things like this, sometimes I feel like Luther in that, you know, I'm trying to, we're trying to, to talk about a different mindset while at the same time trying to live in a world that has a very different mindset and you're trying to strike a balance. Um, you know, biblically speaking, a lot of the prophets and even Jesus just kind of gave themselves up to God's will and let God provide, you know? I can agree with that. There, there really is no balance, no balance. God didn't say for you to strike up a balance. He said, trust in me. Right. Don't you think that was easier though, when you could go out there and fill your boat full of fish? Yeah. I mean, you can still go out there and fill your boat full of fish. Just Depends on where you live. So. Depends on where you live and, and if you have a boat. True. I mean, well, I, I know there's verses that say, sell what you've got and give to the poor. Right. Put yourself really, the way we live today, at a disadvantage in, soci in society's eyes. That would be. Yeah. But there's also a verse that says, if a man will not work, he shall not eat. And sometimes when yeah. you get to that point. <laughs> but that is a verse from Paul. And Paul, much like Luther, had an anger problem. And in that particular situation, Paul is talking to people who are willingly not doing anything. They're like, they're like just expecting Paul to feed them. Um, and that's... To Paul, that's a problem. If you're not willing to work for the gospel, you're not willing to work for anything, then then nobody should be giving you free handouts. I think Paul would differ with Jesus there. Um, and remember, Paul was a regular person, just like us. Okay, He wasn't, you know, yeah, he was a disciple, but the disciples made mistakes all the time. You know, you'll hear about that this Sunday. Don't you think this could be taken to as just not like being really greedy? Like it's okay if you have a car, you don't have to give away your only car, but you shouldn't have 10 cars. Yeah. And I, I agree that 
that that's where you start to seek the balance. The problem is people take advantage of that. Um, you know, so we end up with people like Creflo Dollar, who is that mega church pastor who said Jesus told him he needs a jet. And doubt if the people didn't give him the money to get a jet. You know, I I was I was happy that that I said we needed money for a microphone and people donated for a microphone. You know, if I told y'all we needed a jet, y'all pack my stuff for me. <laughs> we put you on the jet. Yeah. <laughs> well, there are many, I'll call them televangelists that have so much earthly things that they're not sharing that I, it finds me, it makes it hard for me to believe that they're true Christians, yeah. even though they're espousing great sermons, supposedly. And they've got these jets, they've got mansions, they've got expensive cars, and not living to help humanity, it would appear, yeah. living to help their bank account. One of the mega church pastors that I have the least respect for, and that's the nicest way to say it, is Joel Osteen. Mm -hmm. um, because Brother Joel has this thing where he tells people to, you know, send in money and they'll get back some amount of money. You know, it's, it's the prosperity gospel. And he, he doesn't preach sermons about God's grace or anything truthful in the Bible. He takes text out of context and uses them to tell you that God is ready to ignite your life and God is ready to do this, that, and the other with you. And all you got to do is, is just let God in and God's going to do. He's never read the Bible, apparently. You know, who am I to be like, okay, God, yeah, you can come into my heart. Like God needs that permission. God made me. He doesn't need me to say, come on in, bud. His thing with, I mean, he, he has essentially robbed people. He has stolen from them to create this massive media empire that all they do is, is put out basically this fake gospel that says, you know, you can, you can do all these things if you just give God 10 bucks by sending it to me, you know? Name it and claim own, it. Yeah. He has his own channel on Sirius XM. And sometimes when I was feeling really annoyed, like if, or if, you know, if I was trying to work through something, especially when I was driving back and forth between here and Columbia, I would put it on there and just scream back at him during his sermons. <laughs> it made me feel better, but it made the people driving next to me on the interstate think I was crazy. So I was okay with that. They don't know me. So. Well, let's not forget the white haired pastor that had to have a $54 million jet. Oh, so, yeah, and then Stephen pointed out Oral Roberts saying he needed $8 million or God was going to call him home. He would not have liked my response to that appeal. It would have been something along the lines of, well, tell him, hey, you know. Bye, Felicia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to hear that. <laughs> um, yeah, so, okay. All right, so any Final questions on the seventh commandment before we move on to the eighth commandment. What about stealing time? Yeah, stealing time would be another one. Um, so how are you looking at that? Are you talking about like stealing time from others or from yourself or both? Um, I, again, you start out with stealing time from God. Yeah. Um, and going on. Um, from your employers, from your children. Yeah. I've stolen well, a lot of time. It goes on to the bills, too, because if you hold a bill until it's past due through the grace, you basically stole a little bit of time there, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. Or if you do what my parents used to do, where they sent the check for the phone bill to the power company and the check for the power company to the phone company. Or you forget to sign the check, which 
at the church we have done. <laughs> I was on council at Trinity Georgetown, and there would be weeks where we would give the pastor their check and then like, don't cash this. It's not, it's not going to go well. Don't cash this. We'll let you know when it's okay to put it in the bank. So. We've been there. Yeah. Not lately, but we've been there. All right, so any other questions on the Seventh Commandment? Well, I'll just make a, a, another comment about it, actually. And that is, there's, I have trouble sometimes with things that uh, I feel guilty about later. They're usually very small things. Uh, I went to a state park not long ago, and they didn't have anybody at the entrance gate to take money, but they had little envelopes there. And they said, take an envelope, put $3.50 in it, and put it back in the slot. I didn't do it. <laughs> now, but it's like, you know, and then I felt guilty about it afterwards. Uh, or a day that I went shopping and bought some stuff, and, you know, I thought, oh, it doesn't seem like as, you know, like it. the grocery total was as much as it should have been. But, you know, I didn't take the time while I was at the checkout to figure it out. I got home and looked at my receipt and found out there was an item. Actually, the most expensive thing I bought was not on that. But the grocery store was... 10 miles from my house. I was had been down to the Publix. And was I going to call them and say that they didn't charge me for whatever it was I bought? I don't remember now. And I didn't do it. And oh. I feel guilty about it afterwards. How much was the expensive item at Publix? Uh, probably about $20. All right, so if in your next offering, if you'll just write 23.50 in and say for uh, repentance, we'll, we'll know what to do with it. No, and say 10 Hail Mary. Then, you'll be, then you'll be right with God. And Are you selling an indulgence there? Yeah. <laughs> um, I always say that if, if I would, if, if, if I would go back, if the start, if the store overcharged me that much, then I would do something to give their money back. But if it's like a couple of dollars and I wouldn't go back if they overcharged me, then I won't, you know, go back if, you know, I figured all it all evens out. Yeah, I think everybody's had that, you know, there's been times when, when they haven't put <laughs> something on my bill and I haven't said anything, you know, it's easy to do. And it's, you know, you regret it later, but you know, it's kind of, there, there's a little bit of, of, a little bit of part of all of us. It's like, <laughs> I got away with that. You know, whenever we talk about commandments, we're talking about pushing back against human nature. That's the whole reason we have these commandments. So the idea is God knows that who we are, God knows the ways we mess up. And so God put these things in place to help us be a little bit better than we would be on our own, you know, because left to our own devices, we'd be stealing things left, right, and center and lying about things and often people who got on our nerves and everything else. So does that speak to what you're talking about, Bonnie, or am I bad? Yeah. So. No, that, that, that speaks to it sort of. Uh, and of course, then I end up, like I said, I feel guilty, but I also end up rationalizing it and saying that, that oh that was that was grace that i received yeah, yeah. <laughs> well i've never i've i've kept my mouth shut and and enjoyed my windfall but i've never thought it was grace <laughs> yeah. lexi wants to say good night good night lexi night lexi night lexi Night, Lexi. You don't look like you're sleepy. <laughs> she will be. Don't worry. Night. Oh, she better be. She got up before 6.30.
Ooh. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Love you, Lex Lou. Daddy. <laughs> All right, so let's move on to the Eighth Commandment. So you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Um, there is a story that you won't have in your Bible unless you have a Bible with the Apocrypha. Um, do you know what the Apocrypha is? Yes. Yes. So for those of you who don't, basically these are books that that during the Protestant Reformation, the Protestant leaders, specifically Martin Luther in most cases, looked at and said, I don't think these belong in the actual Bible. So they were separated out and put in their own little category, which you have to, you have to buy a Bible that has them. Unless you buy a Catholic or an Orthodox Bible, in which case they're still in there in their normal place. Um, in a lot of cases, it was because these books were clearly later editions and didn't make a whole lot of sense where they were. Um, but in some cases, it was because Luther didn't like them. Um, so the epistle James almost got put in the Apocrypha, mainly because it said um, that faith without works is dead. And Luther didn't like that. And he called it a straw epistle because it it worked against what he was trying to teach and he got all upset about it. So there again, Luther was not infallible by any stretch of the imagination. Um, in any case, the reason I talk about that is because there is um, a book in the Apocrypha called Susanna. It is the final chapter originally of the book of Daniel, but it was added to the book of Daniel much, much later after Daniel was written. So we're talking probably five, 600 years. Um, this is the intertestament period, the part between when Jesus comes and the part when the Old Testament leaves off. Um, without reading it, because it's like 12 pages, the, the gist of the story is there's a lady named Susanna. She is extremely pretty and she is bathing and people are watching her, um, you know, good little bit of voyeurism there. And um, when she gets out of the bath, um, they, two of these elders accost her and say, either you're going to have relations with us or we're going to go and publicly accuse you of, uh, of adultery which was a capital crime. She would be stoned to death if she was guilty of adultery. And if you got accused in that day and age and you were a woman, you were guilty because, you know, men said you were, you were doing it. Men had more credibility in court than women did. Um, women, a lot of times, were essentially regarded as property. So I'm glad we've moved at least somewhat past that. Still some people out there that haven't, but... <clears throat> That's a tangent. Um, in any case, she she refuses um, because she knows she's either she's going to commit adultery or she's going to be accused of adultery. So she's messed up either way. So they drag her to court and they say, you know, this is what happened. We caught her committing adultery. The court convicts her and they're just about to stone her when Daniel comes in and says, wait, we need to examine these two witnesses separately. And so they take the one away and he gives a story and says that she was meeting her suitor under an oak tree. And they take the other one away and he says that she was meeting him under some other kind of tree. And clearly the trees are very different. And so they know that the two are lying. So Susanna gets off and they actually execute the two guys. Okay. This is where um, not bearing false witness against your neighbor comes in. When we talk about this particular commandment, there's, again, the, the legal sense of it, which would be don't go to court and lie about your neighbor, okay? Um, doing that would be harmful to your neighbor. It would be lying 
to authorities lying before God, because most courts you take an oath, it would be um, harming your neighbor. It, it, you just violating all kind of commandments. You're just shattering the stone tablets. Um, so there's the legal sense. But on top of that, there is another layer, like there always is with Luther and the commandments. So Luther says that if you see someone do something, something you know is wrong, you do not have the right to judge them. It's not up to you. There are people in society that have that right, that have been given that right. People like judges, people like uh, political leaders, like kings in Luther's day, people who had judicial power, um, people like mothers and fathers and, and pastors, because pastors would have the, the right of forgiving sins or retaining, which we've talked about before with the Office of the Keys. But you, yourself, unless you're in one of those offices, have no right to judge someone. What you see in secret, you should keep in secret. Okay, and we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. But what that means is you should not say, you know, say I see Sandy steal something from Bonnie's box one Sunday morning. Okay. I should not go out into the middle of the sanctuary and be like, Sandy stole something from Bonnie's box and she's got it in her pocketbook right now and I know it and I know it and I know it. Especially because I don't know that Sandy stole that from Bonnie. For all I know... Sandy had permission to get that from Bonnie. And I've just gone and carried something that could potentially be false into the sanctuary and announced it to the world and cast aspersions on Sandy when I had no right to do that. Okay? That doesn't mean you're supposed to let things go that you see. What you're supposed to do is follow Matthew and go and talk to the person. You go talk to the person and say, you know, hey, I, or Sandy, I saw you take something out of Bonnie's box, and I was just wondering, did you have permission to do that? Okay? And if Sandy says, you know what, Pastor? Go on somewhere. Then at that point, I would need to get other people involved because obviously something's wrong, and I would take two or three others and have a witness and we would progress from there and follow the steps. Okay. I would not go out and just accuse Sandy with no knowledge and Sandy, I'm sorry, you were my example, but you're immediately to the right of me on the screen. So you're the first person I saw. Um, or to use Bonnie's example earlier, you know, now that I know that Bonnie has stolen entrance to a state park, and did not give her $3.50, and she admitted it before witnesses, it's no longer secret. I could then go to the authorities and be like, I have a parishioner who stole entrance to the state park, and I think she should be brought to justice. Okay? I'm not going to do that, because, you know. Yeah, that's a good thing. Yeah. Thank you. That would probably put a whole damper on this pastoral call thing. But... <laughs> It would be public. It's not secret. Okay. So if you have something that you know someone else has done and you're the only one who knows it, you're supposed to go to that person because you're supposed to give that person the opportunity to clarify the situation before you go running them down and essentially judging them in society. Okay. This doubles back into this commandment because you're not supposed to do anything but try to think the best of your neighbor, okay? It's not enough to just not bear false witness. You're supposed to look at them and whatever it is they're doing and try to think of them in the best possible light, even if you're really, really sure that they're not doing something right. You're supposed to try to give them the benefit of the doubt until you can in person confront them. Are there limits to this? Absolutely, okay? If you know for a fact that 
or if you suspect that someone is beating their wife, it is not a good idea to go up to that person and be like, are you hitting your wife? Okay, because one, they're going to deny it. Two, they might hit you. Three, they're probably going to go take it out on their wife if they really are. It's just going to be a lot of problems. Okay, if you know somebody's in danger, you would go to the authorities and allow them to investigate, not, you know, run down the road and be like, did you hear that so-and-so is beating his wife? That's, don't do that. Okay, you take it to the right people who have the right to judge. Are, are y'all following me so far? Yes. Because like the Eighth Commandment is my favorite commandment. Um, <laughs> mainly because it's the one that I struggle with the most. Um, I am not pessimistic most of the time. Um, but having worked in retail for a long time, I have a hard time sometimes thinking the best of people because I've seen a whole line of people come through the store at one point or another that's just trying to get one over on me. And so it makes me naturally, naturally a little suspicious of people. And so I, I have to remind myself to think the best of them rather than trying to go, aha, I got you. I see what you did. Um, you know, that's not the right way to be. It's something that I have to, I struggle with and I do pretty well with it in the parish setting. It's just out in public and, you know, with people that I don't know that well, that I have really struggled with. Okay. So all of that is the private side, right? So the public side of this is if there is someone who's done something wrong and it is publicly known, okay, not publicly known like, like somebody told so-and-so and they gossiped about it and somebody else told so-and-so, we're not, we're not talking about that, but publicly known like everybody saw them do it, then you would not be bearing false witness against your neighbor to testify or to assist in an investigation or to do anything like that. You're not judging them because it's publicly known. You're bringing them to account as you're called to do, okay? Luther tries to do his pretzel move here and say, this is why we're doing what we're doing to the church in Rome because they're clearly wrong. And so we have to call them out and their, their sins are publicly known and we have to make sure everybody is, is aware that they're guilty of this, 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 this. Um, I think that's more of an example of him using a commandment to his advantage rather than using it for its right purpose. Um, if you're doing this to, to prevent, if you're bearing witness against your neighbor and it's not false, then you're not doing anything wrong. But if you're going out of your way to spread rumors about people or to do other things that cast aspersions on them or make people think badly of them or anything like that, then you're definitely against this commandment. You're, you're falling short. Okay. Um, so. Can I interrupt you there? Yes. What's our responsibility if we know someone is doing that? Doing I know of a person that speaks falsely of what other people do or at least exaggerates it. What responsibility do I have to try to correct that? So your responsibility is not to correct because that implies that you have made a judgment that what they've done is wrong. Your responsibility is to go to that person and say, I've noticed this and I'm a little confused. And I wonder if we could talk about it and you clarify what's going on. Okay. So if, for example, that person told you something and you knew that what they said was not the truth, then you would be justified in saying, well, you know, you told me like this, but 
I know that this actually happened this way. So can you explain to me where, where the miscommunication was? Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, but it's a, it, it's a hard thing to deal with. Yeah. Again, I, go ahead. I have a tendency to keep my mouth shut and I'm sure that's not the right thing to do. Well, again, this is, this is God putting rules in place to try to push back against human nature. It's human nature to try to go along and get along, which means, you know, don't make waves. It's also human nature to when you are not around the person that has been doing things to try to score credit with other people by telling them the things you know about that other person because then you look more impressive because you know these secret things, okay? What God is saying in this commandment is you should not do either of those things. You should be willing to go to your brother or sister and say, this is what I've noticed. Can you help me understand? And you do that giving them the benefit of the doubt, okay? All of these commandments, if, if you are able, and, and nobody is able to do this perfectly ever, if, if you could there'd be no reason for Jesus to have died on a cross, okay? At the end of the day, we're always going to fall short. We're always going to mess up. These are not things that you must live by. These are things that you should aspire to, to live a good life, to live a life that is that reflects that you understand that Jesus did die for you, and so you want to do better, okay? So, all of these things push back against human nature. They're, they're countercultural. Okay? They're, they're things that our society doesn't like because it makes you different. It makes you odd to them. Me personally, I don't think that's a bad thing. I've always been weird. It's fine. Okay. But I think that as Christians, we should stand up. We should be different. We should have people looking at us and going, why do they act the way they do? Because it's only through that that we're actually living the gospel. We're actually being the people that God called us to be. And that shows people that there's something different that they need to be a part of. Because we're not like the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. Does that make sense? Yeah. But it's, no, it's no secret that it's hard. You know? No, and there'll always be a gossip truth. Yeah. I mean, even within church, you know, I, so at the other congregation, there used to be a sewing group. The sewing group was disbanded by a former pastor who felt that they were doing too much gossiping. Okay. But if you've spent any time around the church, you know that in the church, gossip is not always what it seems to be okay most of the time church gossip is not malicious and in intent it's people trying to take things that they don't understand and bring them to a group of like-minded people and try to make sense of it so they can figure out how to embrace those people and love them it's not the best way to go about it but it's just kind of a system that has formed within the church when they disbanded that group it handicapped the church from being able to accept new people because they didn't have that process to figure out how to love them in spite of their brokenness. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. There are, you know, you're not ever going to get rid of gossip. You're not ever going to get rid of stealing or any of these other commandments. The only thing you can do is make the best of them and try to live as good a life as you can. And not because you're looking for a reward or because you're trying to earn your way into heaven, because you're already there. You've already got it. Okay. You got that the day that Jesus took the nails into his arms and legs and died. Okay. But all you're doing is trying to live these things out and trying to live a good life because that sacrifice that Jesus made so changed who you are and who you want other people to see that you can't help but try to live a good life. So what are your thoughts on this one? I think you can 
doesn't follow the letter of uh, the law and not the spirit, because uh, if you gossip and what you're saying is true, you're not bearing false witness, but you're also just not being very nice. You know, there again, you're not, when you do that, you're not wishing the best for your neighbor. You're basically bandying around things that are true, but that if other people didn't know, they would think better of them. So, yeah. You know. Hence the term, no one likes the gossip. Yep. Well, when I was a child, I wanted to do things that pleased my parents. Which would be in and, line with the fifth commandment. Yes. Commandment. And I think that the things Four. that we do. Four. Yeah. <laughs> the, the not way not we, to kill one. The way we live our life for me is because I want to please God. I want him to be happy with me. Right. Uh, which is a worthy goal. Yes. But not a goal that you have to hit in order to be saved. Correct. And that is where we differ with some of our other Christian brothers and sisters who essentially, they get you in the door with the gospel and then they slap you with the law and tell you all this stuff that you have to do if you want to get to heaven. You know, you got to let the Lord into your heart and soul and every part of your heart, you know, you know, have you opened every door in your heart? Has Jesus gotten into the living room, the bedroom, the closet, the basement? You know, you can go crazy trying to make sure you're on the right side of that. That's basically why Luther had his moment, was because he could never figure out if he was where he was. He couldn't figure out if he'd done enough to be forgiven or if he'd done enough to be saved. Well, I, I, I tried to mind my own business. And I'm sure that people don't agree with that. But anyway, this person that I was speaking of, then what goes through my mind is how can a Christian behave like that and still get to heaven? And I'm trying to live a much better life and we're going to be in the same place. It's a form of jealousy, I guess. I don't know well, what it is. It is. But remember, and this is something that the modern Lutheran church doesn't like to talk about, but believe me, I was working on our constitution today and it's in our documents. We do believe that there will be a judgment at the end, that there's going to be, you're going to answer for some of the things you've done. You still have Jesus to cling to and Jesus is going to see you through, but you know, you might get questioned on some of those things that you aren't so proud of. Bonnie might have to answer for that $3.50. You know, I, I don't know. Get I can't, the envelope, you know. Yeah, you know. Uh, okay, I was always taught that you would have to answer for things that you didn't repent for. That you didn't well, repent yeah, of. Yeah, and there's there's that. Okay, so like, but then there's also the idea of 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 true repentance. So Dietrich Bonhoeffer talks about cheap grace, which is forgiveness without actual repentance. If you repent of something, it means you had realize that this was a bad thing and you are truly sorry and you are turning away from it. Not that you're going back to it next week and like, oh, well, I guess I better go to confession and forgiveness so I can get that one off me. Okay, that's not repentance. You're just looking for God to be your candy dispenser where you just put in your quarter and get your, your free forgiveness. Okay. If you're truly repentant, then you are going to do your best not to do that again. Um, does that make sense? It does to me. And and I don't feel like I need to seek forgiveness for the same sin that I repented of over and over. I feel like when I have repented and God's forgiven me, that that's it. I don't need to broach that subject again. Unless I do it again, which yeah. I normally don't. Yeah. I don't do the same thing. I do something different. <laughs> I mean, true repentance is hard, okay? Because it's a natural tendency to do things that you shouldn't because 
a lot of times are things that you shouldn't feel good because they they talk to your human nature and you know your human nature likes bad things um the the important part is that you're trying i think at the end of the day we're all going to get credit for trying because that's the most that we can ever do god knows we're imperfect again if god didn't know that there'd have been no reason to give the commandments there'd have been no reason to to get mad at israel but then feel bad and come back and and love them again there'd been no reason for jesus you know the entire history of the church is one of us messing up and upsetting God and God getting angry for a little bit, maybe smiting a couple people here and there, and then turning back and, and remembering that God made us and God loves us and God wants the best for us. Which is the way most parents feel towards their children. we get pews that rock you what could we get pews that rock maybe <laughs> in my teaching parish there was a, a group of ladies who had all had their whenever they had their kids and they were the kids were young they would all sit on the back pew and so they made they used to joke that that was the rocking pew because they moved back and forth so often to keep the kids quiet and worship and they pulled the bolts out of the floor so. <laughs> what other thoughts y'all have on this? Well, one of the things that bothered me is how often this says we are to fear God. Remember, we talked at the beginning about fearing God and what that meant. So there's, there's the idea that we put into fear, which is be scared of. Um, but the idea that Luther is going on is more the biblical idea of fearing God, which is to have great esteem for God and high respect. And so do what you're supposed to because of the greatness of God. Not so much be afraid that God's going to send a lightning bolt to get you, but you know, do what you're supposed to because God is the creator of the universe and, and loves you and didn't have to make you. Do the two great commandments absorb all these others? I don't know that I would say absorb. However, if, so the, you all know the, that Jesus says the two greatest commandments are love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind which is Deuteronomy 6, 4, the Shema. Um, and then love your neighbor as yourself. If you do these two things, you fulfill all the commandments. And what Jesus is saying there is that if you manage to love God, then you're going to keep those first three commandments. You're going to, you know, give God the respect God deserves. If you manage to love your neighbor, you're going to keep those last seven commandments because you're going to be giving your neighbor the respect they deserve. So it's not a matter of absorbing so much as breaking down the commandments into what they are about your placement with God and your placement with your neighbor. What other thoughts? Come on, y'all are smart people and I'm not that great of a teacher. Well, it did come to mind that when you were very nicely asking Sandy about whether she took this from Bonnie's box, that that sounded pretty accusatory. And I think that we have to be very careful when we ask someone something that we don't backhandedly accuse them. So we had a, there's a technique that we learned in pastoral care. Um, so let me preface this a little bit. I took two different versions of pastoral care in seminary. One was with my first semester with the former pastoral care professor who had retired, 
but came back for one semester to teach a class on grief change and loss. And I stumbled into that class because I needed an elective and it was the single best class that I took in all of seminary. And I'm glad because my pastoral care class, not as great as I would have liked. Um, we had a, a process that we used in that class. Um, it was so good that I can't even remember it now. Um, but you were supposed to, basically you were supposed to, to look at a situation and to evaluate it and then mm -hmm you were supposed to make observations that were non-accusatory, that were just facts about the situation, and then move from there to try to talk with someone. And while that's a good process, trying to do it in real life is really uh, hard and weird because you end up making these strange statements to people and they wonder what's wrong with you. Um, <laughs> Like you're like, I observed that the sky is blue and I wonder, you know, if you think it is too, it just, yeah. Your point is well taken in that I should not go to Sandy and say, hey, I saw you take something out of Bonnie's box and I wonder why you did that. A much better approach would be, hey, um, actually, I got to think. Um, so did you, I, I don't know. I got to think about it. <laughs> this, it was hard in seminary too. Um, <laughs> maybe I noticed when I walked by that there was something in Bonnie's box and then you walked by <laughs> and now it's not there. <laughs> and I was wondering, did you see where it went? Uh, no, try again. <laughs> not saying you took it, but um, yeah. So I don't know. It's Sometimes you, have, you might have to wait a little bit. Yeah. The, I mean, no. the easy thing, the easy thing, and the human nature thing is like just skip all that. Don't don't rock the boat yourself. And just be like Bonnie, guess what I just saw, and let <laughs> Bonnie go do the investigation and the accusing and everything. Okay, because then. Your name's Bennett, you're not in it, right? You just get to sit back and enjoy the fireworks. But that's not the Christian thing to do. The Christian thing is to try and think really deeply about how you can approach Sandy without making it sound like she's some kind of klepto at church um, and without causing a scene. So you might preface it with Sandy, did you by chance pick something up out of the wrong box? Maybe it was in Bonnie's box? See, even yeah. that, it, it's still accusatory to some degree. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I got to think about it. I'll, I'll have something for you on Sunday. <laughs> but I won't say it in front of the entire congregation because then that's going to start a whole thing of like Sandy stealing stuff. <laughs> they know Sandy has her fingers in everything anyway. Right. <laughs> You're fine, Sandy. I know nothing. I know nothing. <laughs> see, see, now we know John's her accomplice. Now we know. It's public. Nine people heard it. She probably got the direction from John to begin with. <laughs> so This is too PC for me. Yeah. I would simply say, Pastor, there was a paper in there. Did you see it? Where did it go? <laughs> yep. All right, what other thoughts? Because we're like 14 over, which isn't a bad thing, but. Um, could we get a quick update on, on Christ Community Church? Um, so the termites are gone, but the damage is still there. Um, the engineer who came and looked at it last week um, emailed me today. He met with the engineering firm and they want him to go back and do a little bit more investigation um, Luckily, we've already opened up the other columns and none of them are bad. So you'll be able to see that. And then we're just waiting on the engineer at this point to tell us what we have to do. Because um, once we have 
the the fee structure and once we have all the the pricing and stuff then we can go to lutheran men and mission and say we need money and go from there so as of right now we're worshiping in the fellowship hall which is you know it it's big enough that we're able to social distance mostly and so it's going to work for the time being The, the termites are gone because you had somebody kill them? Oh, yeah. 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 He and I, the, this termite exterminator has been our exterminator since 2017. And when he came in last Tuesday, he was on the defensive immediately, um, basically telling us that essentially it was our fault. Um, he didn't want to, we have a termite bond with them and they didn't want us to try to accuse them of not doing their job because they didn't want to get into a dispute about that. And um, he and I are not on the best of terms because he was like, well, the last time I was here, they wouldn't open up the walls. So I was like, well, that's because most people don't make a habit of knocking holes in the sanctuary walls, you know? Uh, so yeah, but he did, he did spray the termites. So Either they're gone or they've retreated higher up and I can't see them right now. So <clears throat> I thought maybe you just confirmed them. No. <laughs> Although I could I could really boost membership if I named them and, and wrote them into the parish register. <laughs> um, they may However, like suspicious. Kathy pointed out, they wouldn't come back then. <laughs> uh, they they'd, they'd probably, yeah. It's only if I confirm them that that happens because they think it's Lutheran graduation and they haul tail. So, all right. Any other thoughts, questions, opinions, smart remarks? Cool. All right. Um, next week, I have a meeting uh, with the vision team over at Christ Community at 530. So I may not be there for the prayer thing, but we should still be able to, um, Zoom will still be up and y'all can do prayer circle and then I should be able to join you for Bible study. Um, so next week is the ninth and 10th commandment. I think, well, I, mean, I know it's the next two, but I can count. But <laughs> yeah, ninth and 10th commandment. And then the week after that, we're supposed to do a prayer service. Um, that's going to be difficult on Zoom. So um, I may pre-record like evening prayer and just post it for people to watch if you want. And then we'll just take that as a week off. So. All right. Any other questions, thoughts? All right. Hearing none, go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. I will see you all Sunday, at least some of you in person. And Linda, I will pretend that you're back there on the camera. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good night, I'll, I'll be. I'm going to get a picture of you and just stick it back there on the tripod. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night. I watch you every week. I promise. Good night, everybody. <laughs> good night. Y'all have a good night. Good night.